Hello, Canadian Senator Mary Lou McFedrin here, and I want to give a warm welcome to the new Executive Director of UN Women, Dr. Sima Sami Bahus of Jordan. Dr. Bahus, I want to share with you the voices and thoughts of remarkable young women who participated actively in the Generation Equality Forum. And I want to thank most sincerely the whole team at UN Women that made the forum possible, especially Lopa Banerjee and the former executive director Fumzili. And now, Dr. Bahus, please listen to these young women. Hello, bonjour, Tanzi. I'm Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, and I'm delighted to be joined today by three remarkable young women leaders, all who participated in the recent Generation Equality Forum that was hosted by UN Women and also by the countries of France and Mexico. It concluded on July 2nd, and we're having our conversation just about two weeks after that. And I'm really curious to know what the reaction is of these young leaders. I'm joined today by Bibi Hakim and Lays Gomez and Jasmine Griffith Reed. I'll tell you something about my takeaway from this, and that is as an old feminist warhorse who's been at this for decades, I've never seen anything like this forum. The fact that we ended the forum with $40 billion committed exclusively to women's and girls' rights and development is, I've never seen anything like it. Now, we know there's a difference between a commitment and an actual expenditure of money, but it's much easier to collect on a promise than it is uh, to collect on nothing. And the way in which the forum was organized, I wasn't able to participate in all of it. In fact, I don't think any of us was able to see all of it and, and um, be part of all of it. But it's a bit today like the elephant. We're going to touch different parts of the gender generation equality forum and talk to each other about what we heard, what we saw and what our takeaways are. So when we start this conversation, I'm just going to ask if you could just say a little bit about yourself before you tell me something that stood out for you and, and a particular experience that you had. Tell me a little bit about the topic that captured you. And to do this, I'm just going to follow my screen and start with you, Bibi. Thank you, Senator. My name is Bibi Hakim, and I'm a current legislative assistant to the Member of Parliament for Richmond Hill. Prior to my journey in politics, I had the incredible opportunity of working with the United Nations and working with the United Nations Population Fund. And before this forum took place, I had the honor of participating in the consultation team that was trying to prioritize the items that they wanted to bring to this forum. So for me, this is incredibly special that I got to see the before and the after and mm. As you mentioned, this is a forum that's very unique, but one like no other as this forum, we saw world leaders come together and make a commitment towards a better future and what we've all been fighting for, which is gender equality. So for me and my takeaway from this is to see this come full circle. So I am incredibly in awe to see the participation of both public and private sectors within this forum and what took place two weeks ago. That's a really good point, Bibi, that the commitments typically in most UN meetings that I'm familiar with, we have commitments from governments. But in this case, um, we had also, I think it was close to $5 billion in commitments from private sector donors, mostly foundations, and some of, some of whom, presidents of whom, um, like uh, Melinda French Gates, who were actually there and spoke openly about the commitment that they were making. And I think that is a pretty significant um, difference. Can I just ask you, Lays, um, what, 
stands out for you in, in your experience of the Generation Equality Forum? So I personally attend the gender, gender based violence, uh, which is a topic that I had opportunity to work uh, before in Brazil, um, as well as got it, get involved in associations that were taking care of families and also children that were affected by uh, gender based violence. Um, and one thing that caught my attention was the fact that many business, many leaders, they were uh, actually trying to find ways to impact the communities. Because one of the things that, that involves gender-based violence is part of the culture uh, in each country. For example, I'm from Latin America and gender-based violence is very high um, in, in where I'm from. And part of that is also the culture, the way that people uh, grow up, uh, part of the lack of education and inclusion uh, of women. And this uh, factor increase uh, those, uh, um, those violence against uh, women and also against children. So having seen people talking about ways that they could engage those communities, educate and also include women and children that were affected by uh, those uh, crimes, it was delightful um, because it's, it is a, a huge problem in developing uh, in underdeveloped countries. Uh, so that was my taking away from the Thank, thank you, Lise. Um, one of the other innovations that came at uh, pretty much at the end of the Generation Equality Forum was a new compact, a new, a new agreement, um, a global agreement on women, peace and security, which also includes youth, peace and security, and humanitarian action. And one of the things I found interesting about this new compact is the way in which there's an explicit link that's set out in the contact, uh, compact between humanitarian action and women, peace and security, youth, peace and security. And I know from previous conversations with you, Jasmine, that um, women, peace and security is something that you have a growing interest in. And I wondered whether you had a chance to participate um, in this aspect of the forum and also whether you have any thoughts to share on the whole idea of a compact and what you think this might mean moving forward. Thank you, Senator. So yes, um, I am still, I consider myself a novice when it comes to women, peace and security, youth, peace and security. I'm slowly learning the field more and more as I become engrossed in it. And it was shocking to me how much I did not know of this topic ahead of work in your office. Um, as your parliamentary affairs advisor, I've, I've grown to learn more. Um, but it's uh, certainly one that has put a lot of effort into um, becoming more publicly known and becoming a, a key part of um, international and global affairs, as well as um, peacekeeping and conflict resolution. Um, so I did have some chance to uh, attend um, some of the compact meetings um, I was especially interested in the um, Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Um, they had done an event uh, related to the compact, especially on the triple nexus of women, peace and security, humanitarian action and development. And that was such an interesting thing for me to see them bridge the um, gaps that sometimes are put in place between these topics, although they're very complementary uh, um, and they are um, topics that should be working together to um, advocate for um, peace building on a global and local level. Um, uh, it's still considered silo topics sometimes. So it was uh, a fantastic and very eye-opening for myself opportunity um, to hear further about how these intersect as topics and how they all can be used to bridge the gap in terms of gender inequalities, um, conflicts within regions, both in the global north and global south and uh, plenty of other topics. But that was one of the most enriching things to see how it can be bridged. And also for youth peace and security, which even so is considered a, a sometimes a sect or like an mm -hmm. offshoot of women peace, peace and security being brought to the conversation and given equal value and equal consideration um, alongside women peace and security rather than underneath the umbrella. You know, Jasmine, that's raising a really important point uh, how 
so often the truth is that it's often just lip service that's paid to youth engagement and youth leadership. And so let me shift to each of you on this question and to ask, and, and please be frank about this. Um, in, in your experience of the Generation Equality Forum as a young woman leader, uh, what can you share about how you felt uh, about the inclusion of youth perspectives, youth leadership, issues of particular concern to youth, any aspect of part of your reality uh, of being a young leader. And Lays, may I start with you, please? So um, as I mentioned before, I focus on the gender-based uh, violence uh, uh, subject. And I believe that I could see that most of the leaders, they got a programmatic approach where they are actually trying to make change in the communities. So um, I watched someone from Guatemala and she was a she was a youth. She was a young leader and she was uh, telling about her association and her experience uh, trying to um, to diminish gender based uh, violence in Guatemala which was good to see some young voices as well involved in the subjects. And I believe it's important uh, because uh, that is the way that we can um, feel that we are represented by uh, youth as well. Not only the government itself, but also people that are like us, that we feel that we belong some, in some way, and we, that we can also be part of the change as well. Thanks. So for you, overall, it was a positive experience. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I would say that was a positive experience. Thank you. Um, BB, um, you had a particular perspective on this because you were part of the dreaming that went into what actually happened. Um, so maybe you can share what your personal takeaways are from your experience. Thank you, Senator. I am grateful grateful is an understatement to how i feel to have been a part of that process and to have gone to this forum but if i'm being completely frank with you i think that i am a place i'm i'm in a place of privilege because of my job title uh, because of my network and because of my past experience in and with um, politics and policy so I, although I'm very fortunate to have been a part of the consultation process and a participant um, attending the forum, um, I, I think there could have been a better job done in terms of getting more youth to come to the conference. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to see more grassroots organizations and grassroots youth leaders. Um, and I know that's a very hard issue to navigate because there's so many um, strong voices that could have been at the table and it's hard to make a selection but I want to apply a different lens here and that's because um, I grew up in a neighborhood that people would otherwise look past and it wasn't until that I came to Ottawa and started studying in the university um, in the capital that I started to get recognition for things that I started doing such as mental health advocacy for I'm thinking about my colleagues who live in my writing or live in my area who are very strong advocates and very vocal about the issues that they care about and their voices probably could have benefited at the global equality forum but they didn't have the chance to because they a didn't have a network or a strong enough background in a certain field to be part of it I guess and I know that the invitation was open for anybody to participate. Um, the participation part is not really what I'm concerned about. It's more so the amount of voices that reach that table. And mm -hmm. I know everybody's working extremely hard to make sure there's as many voice and dynamic and diverse voices represented. But I think moving forward, um, this would be something to consider. So again, as I'm grateful for the opportunity and to see it come full circle, I think a little more could be done to make sure that grassroots voices and advocates um, reach that table where they're not just sitting there, but they actually get to voice the work that they're doing locally that is part of the bigger picture. 
So one of the things that comes to my mind when you when you use that lens, Bibi, and I want to open this up not only to you, but also to Jasmine and Laïs, and that is, are we talking about a digital divide here? Or are we talking about some other kind of, uh, or more than one barrier that um, limited involvement? I mean, I would think at least in theory that what one of the things that COVID has done that isn't all bad is in fact, we have many, many, many more participants as a result of people being able to come online and register and, and do everything online. So what kind of barriers, let's unpack this a little bit. What, what do we think is really going on here? I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Bibi, and then invite Lays and Jasmine if either one of them have an observation. For sure. Um, so one of the barriers that I have identified is a technological barrier. So although COVID has allowed us to participate virtually, um, because this forum was in Paris and I was in Canada when this mm -hmm. uh, forum took place, uh, it was very nice to do that. But for some youth in my writing, they don't have stable internet or they don't have access to a device um, like a laptop or tablet. Um, another barrier is, um, I, I want to say recognition and um, awareness. So although they do like tremendous groundwork, they're not necessarily picked up by media. They're not necessarily known, um, I want to say, to local representation. And I know, again, there's like members of parliament, there's members of provincial parliament and city councils who represent thousands and if not hundreds mm -hmm. of people. And it's very hard to get that across, but I think in terms of their platform and their ability to communicate is also a barrier. Um, because like I said, like I had this opportunity because of my platform and my network, whereas a colleague of mine who I thought should have been at that uh, discussion panel on um, health and health policies, she wasn't necessarily there because she wasn't known to um, those who were able to submit names or organize it all together. Yes, and, and before I turn it over to Lais and Jasmine, I just wanna add into your analysis, the fact that this is not only about this extraordinary and, and very productive forum, but really it's about the Commission on the Status of Women annual conference at, happened online this year um, and may well happen online in 2022 as well. It's always in March. It's always built around International Women's Day. And on, on one hand, as someone who's spent a lot of time at those sessions um, of CSW in person, um, you know, you're talking about a maximum of about nine, 10,000 that will show up for that meeting in New York. Um, the set of meetings in New York. Um, we had registration at CSW this past year, in terms of registration, well over 50,000. So, you know, we're talking factors of five, eight, 10 times more participation. And you're raising a key question because it's not just about the numbers. It's, it's having to look at, okay, who really is able to participate? And I immediately think about the fact that, interestingly enough, um, the Honorable Maryam Monsef is the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and the Minister for Rural Issues. And this is one of the places where we see a very significant set of barriers, including technology. And of course, when we're talking about um, uh, indigenous young leaders and in indigenous members of, of various communities across the country, when you start to move into the north or other remote areas geographically, you immediately limit involvement because of limitations of the uh, technology that's available. So I'm um, really wanting to hear from Lace and, uh, and Jasmine, if there are any other observations that you've had, um, either related to the Generation Equality Forum or related more largely to um, who gets to actually be there. I was thinking uh, about something um, um, that you were both talking. 
and something came to my mind. Um, so when we were talking about the geographic barriers that uh, we might have, we also need to think about other countries, for example, Af countries from Africa or countries for the, from South America. So some of those countries, they don't even have water sometimes in some mm. of the, their communities. Mm. And how can we make sure that those voices are heard? Th those voices are also educated and are uh, included in the table and in the discussion and in decision, decision making as well. So um, just a thought that when we talk about inclusion, we need to get a lot done in order to include everyone and to also hear and make sure that all the voices are uh, represented, rep uh, have representation as well. Thanks, Liz. Jasmine, any thoughts you have on this? Yes, um, I always was flip-flopping or trying to find ways as I was going through the conference of seeing how we can address these barriers in a different scenario. Um, and so I was still torn between the um, concept that the virtual free forum you know, opened a lot of doors in terms of people, even if they did not necessarily want uh, a seat at the table yet, um, but being able to access the discussions and hear what's going on. So even if you are someone who's uh, learning um, or in your advocacy journey, um, having that pressure removed and just being able to tune in and listen to some of these leaders and help that build that into your own advocacy work. But then as the barriers, some of the barriers were um, saying is that if, if there's a lack of access to technology or um, the means to tune in, then that's also creating another barrier. And then I flip flop again and I say, well, um, being able to tune online in online um, helps with the barrier of cost, um, which is um, one of the biggest factors that I always um, would note for Commission on the Status of Women or any large conference of this nature is you, uh, you, um, often will have a specific part of the demographic of the world who can attend it because they can raise the funds or have the funds to do so. And there'll be um, those who may be doing just as much work on um, grassroots level who maybe do not have the funds to attend. So it was an interesting um, thought exercise for me to consider um, how we could go about addressing both of these barriers of lack of access to technology while also lack of access to funds. And all of that um, uh, was under the overall the lens of, of uh, that BB was uh, speaking to was participation versus active engagement. Um, so even if you're tuning in, if you do not have the seat at the table, then your engagement, your uh, capacity to build forward with everybody else is, is severely limited. And when it comes to young people, and I'm thinking more in terms of youth peace and security, for example, um, not to stigmatize how young people engage, but there, it is known that when we are doing peace building on local levels, it's often um, or can be uh, less formalized and less organized. It allows more flexibility, allows more um, less rigidity and more um, flexibility to address the needs of the community uh, without having to turn into a, uh, um, a very rigid and um, formalized institution or NGO, but it allows us to um, see a need and fill a need as young mm -hmm. people um, in mm -hmm. our communities. And with that, because um, uh, there is already barriers that we've talked about with um, organizations who were at, um, uh, who were able to go to generation equality and organizations who are not and still not having that voice there. Uh, in my mind, it's almost doubly so for young people because if um, those of the average age demographic, I'm using quotation marks because that's very variable, but if those who um, of the average age demographic who work on these big topics, they cannot get a seat at the table, then how it's almost doubly hard to have young people grab that seat when there's already the stigmatization, the tendency towards tokenization of young people and those who are often more marginalized in, in um, the global as well as local communities. So it, all of that was this thoughts that were going through my head in terms of, uh, yes, we had a, um, a, gen a um, generational quality youth task force. Yes, we had young people talking. Yes, we had young people leading sessions. Um, but were, was it enough or did we have enough young people actively 
um, speaking and being heard and uh, actively being engaged in this entire consultation process for all of the working groups and the compact? Was it enough that we can say that it was uh, being driven by young people or just um, young people being a uh, part of it or maybe a side part rather than the main drivers there, the main change makers. And I don't necessarily have an answer because I, like we mentioned, I did not attend the entirety of the conference, um, but it was something that I noted in terms of comparison of, of who was um, engaged in terms of age ranges. That's, that's a very uh, sobering observation and I think it's a, in some ways a cautionary tale. Um, I, I'm thinking now that we're reaching the point where we need to wrap up and I just want to remind um, our audience and ourselves that the next few minutes will be also a separate summary that will run and uh, um, to allow for uh, uh, an understanding of some of the, the key points. So let's cast our eyes forward. And uh, again, inviting each of you to speak very personally, but coming out of the Generation Equality Forum, which was clearly intergenerational, and we can draw different conclusions probably uh, um, based on our our different experiences, but for you, for each of you, what is the key action or takeaway or observation that that is going that you're going to carry coming out of this historic, historic um, generation equality forum, and the kind of work that each of you is doing and that you plan to continue to do? What, what is going to be helpful to you uh, going forward from, from this forum? And I'm going to uh, start with you, Lais, please. Um, I believe that my takeaway uh, is the fact that the organizations, the nonprofits, and also the communities, they would have more resources to create opportunities uh, for uh, those peoples, for example, a woman or youth uh, to have a opportunity um, and also resources to prevent in the case of gender-based violence, also resources to prevent uh, those cases and educate people uh, in a way. Um, this topic is something that comes uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I've worked with that before and I have seen so many people going through the, this um, throughout my life. And I believe that this issue is something that you have to actually educate the community, engage the community, because it's also part, part of the culture, depending on in where you are located uh, around the, the world. Um, so. Having said that, um, seeing all the leaders uh, making commitments to actually act on that and engage the community to diminish those uh, issues were uh, very insightful in my experience. I, I agree with you. And I noted that no longer was violence against women and girls treated as a subset of something else, that it was its own standalone problem, that it was acknowledged as worldwide, crossing all cultures, crossing all classes, all geographic locations. And I think that's a very important shift that, that has taken place. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Bibi what you'd like to share at this point for your takeaway. Um, thank you, Senator. My takeaway is that this forum was very inspirational. I love that more people were able to join as COVID did allow for us to connect virtually. I think this was an inspirational wake up call because as um, as we've seen in the past, um, we knew that we needed to engage with the private sector. And finally, I can say and walk away from a forum where the private sector is engaged. 
Um, and something that I'm going to take away is the continuous advocacy for mental health equity and mental health um, policies for women. Um, I know there was a little bit spoken on, and I know that it's one of the sustainable development goals for wellness for both physical and mental health. However, with the sustainable development goal, we tend to only focus on the physical health. And as we have seen with COVID, um, mental health has been on the rise and mental illness has been on the rise. So I'm looking forward to see what world leaders, grassroots organizations and youth advocates have to say at future forums and the actions that come out of that to make a more fair and equitable um, world. Thank you. Well, Bibi, thank you for bringing the sustainable development goals back into this framework because they have uh, until 2030 to run. So we're just halfway, we're at the halfway mark, have a long way to go. Most countries are a long distance away from meeting those goals. And you're absolutely right. It's not only about the crisis of our physical environments, it's also the crisis of our social environments. So, um, I think that's a that's a really helpful reminder for me as well. And Jasmine, I'm going to ask um, if we can close with you and your observations about what you found to be useful coming out of the Generation Equality Forum for your own work going forward. Thank you, Senator. Um, I really am taking away the um, wonderful experience of having a truly intergenerational forum where that was the focus that was the um events and things that happened it was it was intergenerational and it was moving forward together um with all the ages with all the intersecting identities um towards um uh um lived rights and towards substantive change and transformative change. Um, and as somebody who works in your office and, and knows how crucial it is on our end to ensure that we're continually um, speaking with and engaging with youth and amplifying their voices, I hope that um, that will be brought forward on all fronts from global to local we need to always have that intergenerational factor and that intergenerational voices coming together on any topic we're talking about so whether it's uh, sexual reproductive health and rights and bodily autonomy whether it's about the sdgs but always having that um a youth element um and then in turn then creating an intergenerational lens to whatever we're looking at um and that in turn makes sure our, our um, feminism is really intersectional and is really going to move forward um substantive change for all of us as as uh, global citizens i find that to be a very very useful analysis and in closing this, I want to acknowledge what each of you has contributed. From time to time, you've each acted as youth advisors, and I'm very grateful for that. In your own way, uh, you are leaders in your own right, and bringing your expertise to the many different discussions on the many different topics, it has been a, a tremendous plus for the work that I try to do as a parliamentarian. And I want to thank on the technology side, Jim Gavin, who's with us in our on our summer team from Dalhousie Law School, and also to acknowledge that the the participation that was possible was quite substantial. It was far from what we would all want to see, but it was way better than what we've seen in the past. And so this is part of our journey forward. And I deeply believe that it is the intersectional, intergenerational cooperation that we've been discussing here today and that we saw coming out of the Generation Equality uh, Forum that is going to make a crucial difference. And so thank you. Uh, thank you to UN Women for the initiative to the amazing Lopa Banerjee from UN Women, the director of the civil society section who really was the backbone and the primary organizer of the Generation Equality Forum to UN uh, country members and to members of the, the private sector who also came together. We had a lot of 
of leaders, government leaders, presidents, prime ministers. And we had promises made at a very high level. So now we get to see what each of us can do and what we can do together with uh, various organizations to move this forward and to really make the world better than it is at this time. And heaven knows we're facing huge challenges coming out of the pandemic. And it has changed all of us. It has changed what we do and how we do it. And I think that the Generation Equality Forum provides a bit of a roadmap that's going to be helpful um, to, to all of us. So thank you, merci, miigwech.